I would first like to thank the Berkeley Center for hosting this program today and the many edifying programs that they hold on the role of religion, the persistent role of religion in our world today, and how that ought to influence our public policy, particularly foreign policy. It's tremendously helpful, and I thank them for that contribution. I want to first introduce our four excellent panelists today and then the questions that they will address and then finally turn it over to them for them each to speak for 12 minutes. Our first speaker today will be Gerald Hyman, who is a senior advisor and president of the Hills Program on Governance at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. He's also a member of the Advisory Council to the Center for International Media Assistance of the National Endowment for, Demo for Democracy. He served with the U.S. Agency for International Development from 1990 to 2007 and was its director of the Office of Democracy and Governance for his last five years there. He's also practiced law and been a professor at Smith College. Daniel Brumberg is an associate professor in the Department of Government here at Georgetown and an acting director of the Muslim World Initiative in the Center for Conflict Analysis and Prevention at the U.S. Institute of Peace. He primarily focuses on issues of democratization and political reform in the Middle East and wider Islamic world. He's the author of many articles on political and social change in the Middle East and, and um, has, has bases that on expertise gleaned from living and studying in Egypt as well as conducting field research in Iran, Indonesia, and Kuwait. He's now writing a comparative study of successful and failed power sharing experiments in Algeria, Kuwait, and Indonesia. Tom Melia has been Deputy Executive Director of Freedom House since May 2005. He was previously Director of Research at the Institute for the Study of Diplomacy and Adjunct Professor in the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown, where he continues to teach graduate courses about democracy promotion. For more than a dozen years, Melia, Melia held senior posts at the National Democratic Institute for International Affairs. Eric Patterson is Assistant Director of the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs and has a visiting appointment in the Department of Government. He's also the Project Consultant for the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, Religion, and U.S. Foreign Policy Task Force. His research and teaching focuses on religion and politics, ethics and international affairs, and just war theory in the context of contemporary conflict. He's the author or editor of five books. As you can see, we have some rich experience to bring to the questions today. And I would just briefly like to outline the four uh, issues that have been placed before our panelists for them to address. The first of the four questions is, should the United States seek to encourage the development of stable democracy in particular countries abroad? If so, why? Second, when such countries have significant numbers of religious citizens and religious communities, how, if at all, should U.S. democracy promotion policy engage religious actors and communities? Should the U.S., for example, seek to encourage liberal political theologies within influential religious communities? And if so, how? Third, have U.S. democracy programs in the past tended to ignore religious ideas, actors, and communities? If so, why? And how has this tendency affected our policies? And finally, very practical. Should U.S. funded programs administered by groups such as NED, NDI, IRI, state, and USAID focus more than they do on religious actors and communities? <coughs> so without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Jerry to begin, and each of our speakers will um, succeed for 12-minute segments, and then we'll have a nice conversation with you for the remainder of the time. Jerry. Thank you very much, Jennifer, and thank you for the um, to Tom and to the Berkeley Center for inviting me. And you for coming. Um, unfortunately, I have to catch a plane, uh, so I need to leave here around no later than 2.30. So if I walk out in the middle of the discussion, um, you can either take it personally or not, um, but it has nothing to do with uh, what's being said at the moment. Um, it seems to me these are two, there are two separate, somewhat separate questions here. They're related, but, but really um, quite different. The first is the the first question you put, Jennifer, which is, should the U.S. seek to um, encourage the development of stable democracy abroad? Um, just as a preliminary matter, I, this question keeps coming up, and I'm, I'm frankly puzzled as to why it does. Uh, you, you rarely hear symposia on whether the U.S. should encourage maternal health set around the world, uh, 
or economic growth around the world, or free, even free markets around the world. But for some reason, it sticks in the craw of a whole lot of people as to why the US should promote democracy around the world. And you have to have a list of four reasons, which is what Prime Minister uh, Osnard gave, as to why you should be promoting democracy. And I, frankly, I, I would, it would be great if we had a panel in which two people said, I'm in favor of authoritarianism. And then we could have a real debate. But instead, what we get are people who inherently are going to be in favor of democracy, and nobody in the audience seems to be in favor of the authoritarian alternative. You rarely hear the Burmese junta with a person in the audience saying, no, no, our way is better. So it's frankly a little puzzling to me why we keep having these discussions about whether the US um, should promote uh, stable democracy abroad or not. So that's just a preliminary point. So now, having got that off my chest, I'll say why I think we should. Uh, and the, I want to make a distinction here, uh, as I think uh, I, I think every, everyone up here will, will agree with this. What we're talking about here is civilian uh, programs. We're not talking about military programs. We're not talking about whether the U.S. should use military means to impose democracy around the world. That might be an interesting discussion to have, but that's not the one we're having today. So when we're talking about support for democracy around the world, per se, it's always civilian. The reasons are always civilian. Now, I realize that in the last week or two, it's been a bit of a um, Washington industry here to say that we're not in Afghanistan to support democracy. That's not why we went there, or it's not why we shouldn't. I have no idea where, the, uh, where it came from that the reason we went to Afghanistan was to support a flourishing liberal democracy. I don't remember President Bush or any other member of the administration ever saying that the reason we're going to Afghanistan is to support liberal democracy. That may have been an element in the strategy, but it was never the purpose or objective of going to Afghanistan. I don't remember it. As I recall, it was at best, or at worst maybe, a, an emotional response to the events of 2001. And maybe it wasn't well enough thought through. I think that there's a good case to be made for that. But I don't remember anybody ever saying, there's this place called Afghanistan, and they, have these, they, they don't have a democracy there, and I think we ought to send uh, the, the mountain uh, brigade to Afghanistan to make sure there's flourishing democracy there in 10 years. Nobody ever said that. It was never part of the um, objectives of going there. Now, it may have been, and I would argue, be happy to argue in the discussion, that it is an inherent element of counterinsurgency that there be a democracy program. But that's different from saying that's why we went to Afghanistan. So what we're talking about almost, in and Afghanistan and Iraq are two countries out of 100 and whatever in which there are democracy programs. So we're talking about, at best, 2% or so of the countries in which there are democracy programs where there is also a military uh, engagement. We are talking about civilian engagements abroad. So it seems to me the answer to the question is yes, we should be supporting it with civilian uh, purpose, with civilian means, um, the development of stable democracy abroad. And I, I'd say two reasons. One is our values, and the other is our interests briefly on the values part, and then get to the interest part, uh, a world of democracies, a world, are, are we better or worse off, I would say, in terms of our values, that Central and, and Eastern Europe are now democracies, or at least Central Europe is? Are we better off or not better off? Is a part, is, are, we be, are our values better? more engaged and uh, more successfully engaged in Latin America for the fact that Latin America is now, by and large, a, a hemisphere, or this hemisphere is a hemisphere of democracies, whereas it used to be a, a, a hemisphere of military juntas. Again, I like the person who says no to please put up their hand, come on up, and then let's have a discussion. Otherwise, we're having a discussion amongst people, we're having a discussion amongst the believers. And I think that's mostly what these discussions have been about. It seems to me it's very clear 
that the values of freedom and the values of our Constitution and the values that we hold as Americans and as um, it, not just in the United States but Western Europe and East Asia are advanced by having uh, supporting civ civilian means democracies around the world. Secondly, as to our interests, it seems to me that it's very clear also that a world of democracies is far more, more stable, is far more secure for us, and is far more in our national interests as well than a world than the alternative. Imagine the alternative. The alternative would be a war of authoritarians, a world uh, like we potentially faced when we had uh, an adversary in the Soviet Union. If the Soviet Union had succeeded, as it seemed to at one point, and the rest of the world had become more like the Soviet Union and less like the United States, would our security be improved? Would our uh, trade be improved? Would our standard of living be improved? What part of our national interest would be improved if we faced a world of authoritarians? It seems to me totally unlikely and, and not very sustainable as an argument. However, the question that really ought to be raised is the modality. How do we, how do we support uh, democracies around the world? Not whether we should. And it seems to me that it depends, uh, there are two ingredients in my, my view about, uh, that, that engage uh, our modalities. The first is the political, economic, and social conditions of the country in which we are doing the supporting, in which we are trying to assist um, local actors in advancing democratization. Is there political will? Where is the political will? Are the Democrats going on an uphill fight, or are they winning, or are they, who are, who are their adversaries, who are their allies, what are their causes, what are the obstacles, what are the problems? All of these kinds of issues um, get uh, in engaged in a decision about how to promote democracy, not whether. And the second question is how much money, how much uh, should we engage in, in, in democracy building? And that, it seems to me, is a function of our national interests. To what extent does, that, does the democracy in that country engage our national interests? And secondly, to what extent would democracy engage the regional interests in which that country exists? So first, uh, how, how, much, how do we do it and how much money do we spend doing it? Those are much more uh, fine-tuned kind of questions than whether we should do them or not, and I hope perhaps in the discussion we can get into the, those questions a little bit more deeply. For some period of time after the uh, fall of the Berlin Wall, the momentum for democracy was clearly um, uh, positive and, and um, quite substantial. That momentum, I think it's fair to say, has diminished substantially. Perhaps even there are recessions of democracy in, in countries. Countries that have looked like they were going toward democracy or might, might even have arrived to some extent and are now moving backwards. Most or much of the former Soviet Union may be in that, ca in that camp, with the possible exception of Georgia and Ukraine, uh, and of course the Baltic states. But the Central, Central Asia, uh, Russia itself, uh, Belarus, and so on are clearly not uh, in the same position that we thought they would be in, not in the position we thought they would be in uh, at, this, at this time. The alternative, of course, to engaging with Democrats uh, uh, around the world and trying to advance democracy is to sit idly by, not do anything, where, where the forces of authoritarianism are engaged, whether they be international or national. And I don't see that that is a prescription for either our values or our national interest. So not only you have to ask yourself, should we be doing positive work, but what if we didn't? What's the counterfactual? What if we didn't do anything? Would, we be, would that make for a better world, either in terms of our values or our interests? And it seems to me it would not that the forces of authoritarianism, whether domestic or international, uh, would, I think, not sit still. There are people who say, well, what we really don't, we don't want democracy. We shouldn't be promoting democracy. 
What we should be promoting is the rule of law and good governance. That's what we should be promoting. And democracy is a whole other matter. So I say to you two things. First, what do those people have in mind when they mean, when they say democracy? What, what's, in the, what's in their head? What does the word democracy mean for them? For me, the rule of law and good governance are a part of, but not the whole of, democracy. So to say we want rule of law and good governance, but not democracy, is to me a little bit unclear, unless you don't want the other elements that are also in the democratic package. And that is what I think they seem to be meaning. I think what they mean is we don't like elections. Or rather, we like elections for us, but we're not so sure about those guys. And why are they not so sure about those guys? Well, they're not ready. You hear that a lot on Afghanistan and Iraq. They're not ready for elections. When they get rule of law and when they get good governance, then let's talk about elections. I say to myself, well, who is the us that's going to be doing this talking about elections? I mean, who are the we that are going to decide that they've reached the right stage to have elections? It's clearly not the Iraqis or the Afghans. It's not the Iraqis very clearly, just to take two examples, not the Iraqis for a very clear reason. The Ayatollah Sistani, however Delphic his other pronouncements are, was extremely clear with Viceroy Bremer that the one thing he insisted upon was elections. He said, no elections, no support, no legitimacy. That was Ayatollah Sistani, not the world's most ardent proponent of democracy on television and in talk shows. A person who sits, who is a primarily a religious leader, made it very clear that he would not support any American occupation that did not include a relatively quick election. The same thing is true of, oh my goodness, same thing is true of Afghanistan. Who put elections in the Constitution of Afghanistan? Who asked for elections just recently? It wasn't just President Obama or President Bush. How are you going to get a legitimate government, a legitimate government? How are you going to get this credible partner that everybody's talking about unless you have a legitimizing event? What is the legitimizing event? It seems to me it's clearly a, an election. I'll skip the rest of the panoply of electoral matters, and we can, I mean of democracy matters, come back to it. The second question, though, is the question of religion. And here, it seems to me, one ought to be a little bit careful. <clears throat> Not because one wouldn't want to engage religious actors, but because it's a sensitive matter. And it seems to me that there are people around the world who take their religion seriously and who would look at our engagement in their religious life skeptically, who would say, what exactly are you doing here? Are you trying to convert us? Are you trying to subvert our religious beliefs? What exactly is your purpose in engaging with us on, religious, on our religious issues and yours? To the extent that they want to engage, I say, great. But I would be very careful about advancing a religious agenda or advancing religious issues for tactical and strategic reasons, not for theological reasons or principled reasons. And that is, are we likely to be mistaken in what our motives are? Are we likely to be mistaken in what we're there to do, and, and so on? So to me, it's trickier to mix the religious discussion with the democracy discussion for tactical and strategic reasons, not for principled reasons. Secondly, we do have a constitution, so we have to be a little bit careful about that. What engagement do we have with US government funds? Private funds, a whole different matter. But US government funds, which is what most of the activities of the kinds of organizations you're talking about today engage with, US government funds engaging on religious uh, um, dialogue, I think, is a tricky matter, one that ought to be carefully lo looked at, carefully thought through, before one simply plunges uh, forward. Um, Lastly, I think it's worth asking of the democracy promoters in the world what they really do think about a religious, a, a country that has an overtly, self-consciously religious identity. 
Some, I think, in their heart of hearts would argue that that is not truly a democracy because we have the separation of church and state. But is that an inherent ingredient of democracy? I don't think so. And it's not so clear to me what would happen if a country like Turkey, which is, a, at least on the border, of self-consciously identifying itself as an, as an Islamic country, as a Muslim country, is that, does that make it less of a democracy? What about Indonesia, which is not self-identified as an, as, as an Islamic country? What about other countries which have most of the rest of the ingredients of democracy but are self-consciously religious? And I, it seems to me that in the heart of hearts, there are a lot of democracy promoters who would say, well, maybe not. And it, it depends. And the question is, what does it depend on? And maybe we can talk about that in the discussion. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jerry. Dan? No, thank you very much. Um, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me join the panel today. I'm delighted to have uh, two old friends with, I, I don't mean old in the sense of, uh, no. I mean, we've been friends for a young long friends, time. Young friends. And uh, but for we, my my colleagues on the left and the right, we've been working together for quite a few years on these issues from different angles, all the way back to when Tom was at NDI, and so it's something I've been thinking about for quite a while. I also would like to make two other points, and that is missing from my biography is the fact that I'm not here to brag. I'm simply it's a statement on, on the, uh, with an institutional interest. I do co-direct the center co-direct the program Democracy and Governance, at which Tom has taught before. It's the only MA program in the country that provides uh, an MA in the study of democracy, governance, and political change. Uh, and it's here at Georgetown, we're proud to say. Um, and I also have to say that I, too, have a plane to catch. And, and this plane is for, I'm afraid, for Cairo, uh, where I'm going to participate in a conference uh, bringing young Democrats, both Islamists and secularists, together around the table to talk about their political future. And that's fortuitous because it's in part what I want to talk about very briefly today. I recognize that we have very limited time. Uh, four questions. My answer to the four questions, first of all, are yes, no, no, and not really. Let, let me elaborate for that <laughs> on that. Um, first of all, I think that the, the clear answer, and I'm a, a very committed believer in, is that the United States should be pro uh, active in providing democracy assistance. Uh, the democracy promotion would suggest that we're there promoting something that isn't necessarily there. Assistance, I think, is a term I know my friend uh, uh, Ken Wallach uses. I think it's useful to think about uh, uh, the term assistance implying that we assist those who are actively involved in promoting democracy and would like to work in some sort of partnership with us. Um, but I think that for purposes of answering these very difficult questions, we have to think somewhat deductively about how the process of political change works in different regions, and based on those assumptions, uh, come up with certain kinds of practical prescriptions for U.S. policy. And for this purpose, I like to make a crucial, I think, elementary distinction between two different things, one of which is political liberalization, and the other is democratization. Um, uh, you'd be shocked to learn that a distinction that, that in the field of political science is obvious to many of us is not necessarily made by those who are involved in the democracy assistance uh, world. Uh, it's extraordinary. Um, and I think there are good reasons why on the, on, the, on the ground level they don't like that distinction. But it is an important one from the point of view of not only analysis but prescription as well. Um, in the part of the world that I think I'm going to address here ex uh, pretty much exclusively, the Arab world, and I have also written extensively on Iran, and we can talk about that as well. Um, uh, there's lots of liberalization without democratization. Uh, regimes are extremely adept at uh, providing uh, political space, usually on an informal uh, basis, but sometimes on a de jure basis as well, for various political groups to uh, express themselves. Uh, with the proviso that they don't challenge the regime's hegemony. Um, and that sort of system allows these groups to let off steam. It allows for a certain degree of contestation, competition, and of course, ultimately, what it allows these regimes to do is to play one group off against the other. And that is why every self-respecting autocrat in the, in the Arab world prefers several thousand civil society organizations to, th to over two or three really effective ones. Because the idea is if you can keep everybody busy liberalizing their, each other and their societies, they won't focus their attention on the issue of democratization. Um, 
and that sort of game uh, is an elaborate, uh, well, for want of a different word or a better word, it's a protection racket. Um, what these regimes do is they provide protection to all sides. <laughs> um, they favor sometimes the Islamists or their chosen Islamists, and sometimes they favor the non-Islamists, who are not, by the way, the same as secularists, because there are plenty non-Islamists who are pious Muslims who are not advocating for merging uh, mosque and state, for example. Um, and so these regimes provide a certain amount of protection, space, and they are particularly adept at allowing Islamists a degree of, of, of room for maneuver sufficient to threaten the secularists such that they feel that they have to go back and depend on the state for political protection. And under these rules of the game, implicit as they are, but very effective, uh, there is a tendency uh, by leaders of so-called oppositions um, in the last few years not really to challenge the name of the game, not really to challenge the red lines as implicit as they are, uh, and to ultimately find their own patrons in these regimes to provide certain kinds of incentives. So if you go to Egypt, if you go to Kuwait, if you go to Algeria, Morocco, you will see that Islamists and secular and non-Islamist groups have within these various regimes powerful political players who provide them certain kinds of goods and services, patronage of an economic, political, and ideological kind. And on that basis, they often prefer going to seek that patronage rather than um, uh, work among themselves to change the the balance of forces in terms of the, uh, the balance of forces between regimes and oppositions. Now, uh, for for better or for worse, uh, and probably not, we're not intending it, but one consequence of U.S. policy, and I've written about this extensively, I think I'm on record as saying this, is to abet this sort of protection racket uh, through strategies which focus not so much on democratization but political reform, a term that has been hijacked repeatedly by leaders in the region, uh, and liberalization at the expense of democratization. And that way we can have our cake and eat it too. Well, we can talk about, uh, oh, well, we we're promoting freedom of discussion or this and that. Uh, at the same time, we can maintain our strategic links with regimes. And Egypt is a classic a case of this, but also Morocco, another one. And, and be in the business of saying we're, 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 we are supporting Democrats at the same time not doing it in a way that would really uh, provide the this, this spooky prospect of regime change a la democratization. Um, and, uh, and so that is basically how the policy has been played for the last 10 years. It's not a bad strategy. It, I mean, I really think that what I call a liberalized autocracy in the Arab world is far better than a full despotism. Um, uh, you can go to Morocco and say pretty much anything you like, so long as you don't challenge Amir al-Mu'minin, uh, the commander of the faithful. Um, and that's, but that's much better than getting killed. I mean, I think, Tom, you would agree that the, even in the absence of full uh, human rights, not getting killed by regimes is better than getting killed. And these regimes thrive on that basic distinction. Um, the question that therefore becomes under these circumstances, and given the model which I've just sketched out for you in the briefest and simplest of ways, uh, whether uh, oppositions uh, can find a way to, uh, to break the stranglehold of that logic, uh, whether they can find ways to speak to each other <laughs> instead of the regime. One of the paradox of this sort of dilemma is that the more liberal you are, the more the incentive is to speak to the regime and not to one another. Now that may seem counterintuitive, uh, and it's meant to be in some sense, uh, but it's not surprising that w the most liberal regime in the Arab world, which is I think probably Morocco, maybe Kuwait too, um, is the least democratic in some respects. Uh, because everybody knows that if you want to get anything done, you know where to go. The address is the king. So the Islamists and the secularists do not speak to one another. And if they do, it doesn't go very well. And I can tell you from experience, because we've had conferences at USAP, also co-sponsored by Georgetown, where we try to get these guys around the table, and it doesn't work out very well. Uh, but nevertheless, I think that's important. And that's why, in answer to some of your questions, I don't think it's useful for the US to define this problem as an Islamic problem. Uh, it's an identity problem. It's a political problem. And I don't think the solution will be found, and I've said this again, and publish this in various places. I don't think the solution is found in the effort to promote, promote a liberal uh, Islamic uh, ideology. Um, I think this is a dangerous game. I think it could easily backfire. I've been debating my colleagues for years about this, but I think there's a very interesting piece in the Post about Indonesia and this very issue and how in different ways our efforts to promote a liberal Islam there didn't succeed. I think what we have to do is promote a, an institutional context, 
with rules and institutions which change the calculations of the players, both within regimes and in oppositions. So you get some movement beyond state-managed political liberalization. Because state-managed political liberalization can go on for a long time, but it's also vulnerable to collapse, particularly under conditions of economic crisis, uh, sudden exogenous crisis from a, a regional shock of one kind or another, economic, strategic, what have you. So there are reasons to promote institutional changes, and that's going to require thinking about the problem not in as, as an Islamic problem, but in part as an identity problem, but part as, a set of, as an institutional problem for which there are institutional solutions. And the beginning of this is not to worry about, as I've said, fixing Islam, but by, by addressing the political context in which Islamists and, and their rivals compete. Uh, and that's going to require, of course, getting them to talk to one another and, and find some ways to agree on a set of rules, a kind of political pact, not between regimes and oppositions, that has to come later, but first within oppositions. Um, so they defeat the logic of the protection racket, which these regimes are so adept at assessing. Two minutes. I'm right on target. Um, thank you very much. Um, and so that's, that's the first order of business. And if we overdo the Islamist question, it's going to backfire. Because by favoring Islamists over any other group, these regimes are going to, first of all, panic. And second of all, the seculars are going to panic. And we're not going to have a dialogue. We're not going to have any movement. So we have to create space, safe space, for these various groups to have a, a not a, the usual kind. We have, in the Middle East, you have dialogues, hiwar, all the time. Everybody's got a dialogue. But these are orchestrated by regimes. They're not real. And so we have to find ways to make them real. Uh, and we have to, beyond that, and here's the tricky bit, get states to create reforms, real reforms, not the kind of tactical reforms that they create all the time, but strategic reforms, what I call strategic liberalization, uh, that really opens up the political space so uh, Islamists and their rivals can, can debate in a serious way and, and so other voices uh, can express themselves and I think in that way redefine the political game. So the real issue is not fixing Islam, it's not promoting Islamic liberalism, that may or may not come, but it has to come out of a constitutional, of a, of a constitutional and institutional context which the U.S. should be actively involved in supporting. And what that means is we have to look at the bottom-up prop and the top-down part as well. I would hope that the, the Obama administration uh, would be ready and willing to sustain uh, public encouragement, let's put it that way, of regimes to move beyond state-managed liberalization. The problem here is that in, in terms of the, the so-called Muslim world, certainly the Arab world has become very much secondary to the administration's agendas. The emphasis has gone quite understandably to Pakistan and Afghanistan. And um, it's very difficult to, to say with any conviction right now that the issue of democratization uh, is one that the administration is, is engaged in as much with equal passion by comparison to the strategic issues. And I'm hoping that the balance in that regard changes. Thank you. Thank you. Tom. OK. Um, thank you, Jennifer. And uh, thank you, uh, Berkeley Center, for uh, bringing us together. Thanks to Tom Farr and the others who have pulled us all together. Um, I, I always think that it's more important to get together and have a conversation than simply to read one another's excellent writing, like my colleagues here write excellent things, which I enjoy reading. But I think it's always better to get together and, and talk about them, because I think we, we learn more together than we do if we each sit alone in a room and read things. And uh, so I welcome this opportunity, and I congratulate the uh, Berkeley Center for this. This is why the Berkeley Center exists, is to convene us for these kinds of things. Now, um, uh, we have been invited to talk about, uh, specifically, about the integration, or lack thereof, of religious freedom in the American effort to foster or assist democratic emergence in the world. Now, this is a bit of a setup uh, by Tom Farr, who, <laughs> last spring wrote the book that explained all this, uh, The Future of U.S. International Religious Freedom Policy Recommendations for the Obama Administration by Tom Farr and Dennis Hoover. So any of you who think you're going to get better answers from this panel than from this book are mistaken, because all the right answers are in here. Let me just stipulate that up front. Uh, and uh, I, want, I don't want anything I say to be misconstrued as being a challenge to anything that's in here. Because everything in here is correct and true. Um, even if you wouldn't agree with everything with equal fervor. Uh, 
uh, there's a lot of good stuff in here. And so I commend this to all of you who are interested in how the uh, administration may, may uh, see the road going forward. Um, it's uh, detailed and informed and practical in ways that sometimes uh, professorial discussions are not. So um, read the book. It's good. Um, secondly, and this is one of the things I learned already at this table, I think it's important to uh, talk about the, the moment that we're in in the world. Uh, Jerry, I think, talked about, uh, one, or, well, one or both of you may have talked about uh, recession in political performance around the world. Well, we are now living in a global political recession. Um, the findings from my colleagues at Freedom House who've tracked the rise and fall of political rights and civil liberties around the world show that in each of the last three years, uh, there have been more countries experiencing declines than improvements in freedom. Uh, and over three years, it's the first time in the 38 years that we've been tracking this that there have been three consecutive years of more downturns than upturns. Um, I think that constitutes a global political recession and it predates and is aggravating the global economic recession in which we find ourselves. So the moment is dire in terms of political freedoms more generally. And looking at religious freedom or any other subcomponent of it, I think has to be understood in the context of this general global downturn that uh, we are engaged in and that the Obama administration uh, finds itself in as it comes into office. Apparently now in month 10, we're still coming into office, still forming the administration and still forming policies. Um, so there's time yet to, in, to uh, influence that. Um, one of the things that uh, the Obama administration inherited, uh, uh, and this uh, goes to a point specifically that Jerry made about distinguishing between civilian democracy promotion and military initiatives in the world that may be construed as, as democracy uh, promotion efforts. Um, in the budget that President Obama sent to Congress in the spring for the fiscal year that began a month ago, but isn't yet enacted by the Congress, um, the part of the foreign aid budget that comes under the rubric of uh, governing justly and democratically, very broadly the democracy part of the foreign aid budget, 47% of all the money proposed to be spent is to be spent in two countries. One's called AFPAC and one is called Iraq. And these two, or some people still call them three countries, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Iraq, 47% uh, of our democracy promotion efforts are in these three places, which are countries at war uh, among themselves, with international forces, on the ground. Uh, these are militarized environments, certainly. They're conflictive environments. And that's where about half of our efforts in democracy promotion are happening these days in the world. And so I think it behooves us to be cognizant of the way that we will be seen more broadly in the world as doing democracy. We're doing democracy disproportionately in countries that, where we have troops. Um, so I think that has to be understood as part of the backdrop to this effort. Uh, that said, uh, I do agree with Jerry that uh, what we're really talking about is not the deployment of troops, although that's a background context that's very important, but what we as, uh, as civilians, as NGOs, as diplomats, as aid workers, and so on, all of the non-uniformed people that go abroad to try to make it a better place, um, what we do about democracy promotion. And uh, in that regard, I think uh, it is, to go back to some of the questions that were posed to the panel, it is true that uh, religious freedom is not one of the major uh, points of focus of those efforts. In fact, I would agree with the implicit premise of the, the questions that were put to us that it's undervalued, that the, the importance of religious freedom as one of the building blocks of democracy is undervalued in our collective efforts in the world and could use some, some enhancement. Now, it's not to say that it's, it's entirely avoided. Um, uh, again, you all know here in this audience about the broad institutional array of uh, agencies and policies and, and requirements that we've put on our diplomacy to report on these issues and to take it to our diplomatic encounters with other countries for uh, falling short on religious freedom performance. Um, but it also, in the last couple of years, really, has grown into the programming part of the, of the budget as well. Um, there is, uh, uh, I, the, the, this conference prompts me to wonder whether somebody's really done an audit and looked at how much of the funding by the National Endowment for Democracy or by USAID or by the State Department's DRL Bureau or the MEPI program in the NEA Bureau have been devoted to things that could be construed as religious freedom. 
I think that would be a good place to start. Somebody should do that. One of your graduate students, Tom, should be uh, plotting this, uh, uh, this data. Um, but I know that there is at least some of it going to this area. And I know that DRL at the State Department in particular has put out some programs, some budgets, uh, some uh, solicitations for programming, um, not to go in and in d help determine which factions in religious or doctrinal disputes should prevail, whether moderates versus conservatives or liberals or whatever, but to be uh, building the capacity of civic groups in some countries to be more effective uh, advocates for religious freedom. They don't have to be religious groups. They could be civic groups or university centers or press freedom uh, clubs and so on, but groups that value and appreciate uh, religious freedom and would like to strengthen their capacity to be better at uh, providing an operating environment in which people are free to be as, as religious in, in any direction they want. Um, so I think there's some of that. There's some of that happening, but I don't know how much, in a, uh, but I suspect it's not enough, in part for the reason that Jerry alluded to, uh, anxieties about American constitutional precepts about separation of church and state and whether and how that extends to our foreign aid and our engagement abroad. I think um, there's probably a lot of reasons for it, um, but I think it's uh, probably a demonstrable fact that we don't spend as much uh, time in our democracy assistance efforts uh, bolstering religious freedom as we could and as we should. Now, in going forth to do more of that, whether as diplomats, aid workers, NGOs, um, students and professors uh, crossing boundaries in, in exchanges and so on, I think that one of the things that Americans should be more uh, mindful of is our own history. Uh, the emergence of religious freedom in the United States. Now, there are a lot of things about the American system that are not really good for export, like election administration or political party um, operations. The American models really don't bring much to the world's uh, best practices discussion. But uh, there are a couple of areas in which Americans have a particular uh, inherited expertise and something that we should really be proud of and could take forth and talk comfortably about. And one of them is how religious freedom came to be uh, one of the defining characteristics of our society. Um, now, um, I don't think people know how it happened here. I think there is a kind of, uh, outside of this room, there is in the fields of democracy promotion and diplomacy and so on, I think there's probably a, a, an overly simplistic view about separation of church and state that doesn't appreciate how contested a concept it is uh, and always has been about how um, the religious freedom that we enjoy today has emerged from two centuries and more of uh, debate, uh, legislation, contestation, litigation, uh, constantly revisiting what it means to find a balance between uh, uh, conflicting uh, rights and conflicting freedoms uh, in, in the United States. And that story about how the, the, the balance line has moved over time um, and the ways in which it's been contested and battled, I don't think that enough of us know that story well enough to be able to tell it abroad or to share it with countries in which uh, contests are underway now about the proper role of religion in politics and politics in religion. Um, the American story is, I think, a valuable reference point and one that we should be able to tell more widely and uh, with greater pride than I think we, we usually do. Now, we at Freedom House, um, have tried to do a little bit of this. Um, we published a book last year called Today's American, How Free? Question mark. Because when we travel around the world or when we are publishing assessments of the state of freedom in other countries, we're always asked, well, who's looking out for the state of freedom in America while well, you're telling us what to do or whether we're doing well enough? And so well, the answer, of course, is that there's lots of groups here working on protecting and advancing freedom in the United States. Um, but we thought it would be useful to do a book. So we, we published a book, and one of the 10 chapters is about the story of religious freedom in the United States and the story of how we got to where we are today. And while um, this chapter is not, not by any means the full story, it's a reminder that um, it, it has to be understood in historical context and we need to be familiar with our own history. Um, the other thing about what we ought to have with us or keep in mind when we go abroad that I would like to put on the table is um, that uh, in the democracy assistance business that uh, several of us have been involved in uh, for a number of years, we uh, focus mostly on process. 
uh, how elections should be held, what kinds of laws should govern the operations of NGOs or courts or the marketplace and so on, the legal frameworks and the institutional bulwarks of those uh, rules of the game. And I think that's all good. Um, but there is a point at which we are talking about form without content. And I think the other part of uh, our engagement in this effort that has been wanting is to talk more about <coughs> values. Uh, what are the values that should inform our participation in these democratic political processes? And um, I don't know exactly how government-sponsored programs can promote values exactly, but I think we need to find a way to uh, bring it into the discussion a little bit more. Um, there's different kinds of values. They're not all, not all values are democratic. Um, not all of them reinforce the, our better angels, our better instincts. Um, I think that that's different than promoting factions in doctrinal disputes. Uh, I'm very averse to the notion that we should be choosing which parts of Islamic theological debate should prevail or that we should take a direct interest in that. I think that if we can uh, uh, strengthen values of tolerance in particular, um, which may not be done through a discussion of religion at all, promoting tolerance as a value that people hold and, and exhibit, I think does not depend on an explicitly religious discourse, but I think um, one of the things that emerges from uh, some opinion research in the world uh, that I just heard about over last weekend, Ron Englehart, who's done a lot of study of uh, public opinion worldwide uh, as it relates to democracy in different cultures, he's coming up with a thesis that he says he's gonna publish soon that says that a more important predictor or correlate of whether societies become uh, democratic is whether than whether people say they support democratic political processes is if they say or if they demonstrate that they uh, uh, have attitudes of tolerance of diversity, tolerance of the other, the other being uh, women or foreigners or gays or people of a different religious uh, persuasion. That tolerance is a much more important and enduring predictor of whether people will find themselves living in a democratic political system uh, soon thereafter than uh, any other directly political question or attitude that you can ask. So I think we need to find a better way to think about values and how we can incorporate that into our, our work abroad. Um, because I think that has been one of the bulwarks of our um, growing democratic experiment here in the United States. And um, that may be something that we could take on the road um, as we travel. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Tom. <laughs> Eric. Thank you. Uh, as one of the faculty here at the Berkeley Center <coughs> and at Georgetown, I welcome all of you. I'm particularly glad to see my Tuesday afternoon class here. <laughs> they were unusually happy when I told them last week that they would only have to listen to me for 15 rather than 90 minutes. <laughs> that disappointed me a little bit. Well, uh, my paper is entitled Obama and Sustainable Democracy Promotion, and I'll start with a slightly different tack than the other presentations today. And three big points. The first one will be uh, what has the president and what do senior administration officials, what are they saying about promoting what they call sustainable democracy? Second, what are they doing? We have a, a limited one-year track record at this point. And then third, some lessons for them, uh, largely drawn from the Bush era. Now, there's a full 30-page paper with stats and graphs and things that I'll present at a scholarly conference later. This will be necessarily condensed. So, first of all, what is the administration saying? And what I would, if I could condense the message on democracy promotion down to one thing, it's that uh, President Obama came into office with the notion that democracy is about institutions. That makes him quite different from Bush, who tended to talk in terms of values. Let me take you back to his debut speech at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs in April of 2007, when then candidate and Senator Obama said, We've heard much over the last six years about how America's larger purpose in the world is to promote the spread of freedom, that it is the yearning of all who live in the shadow of tyranny and despair. I agree. But this yearning is not satisfied by simply deposing a dictator and setting up a ballot box. Then he goes on to describe what he means by democracy. It requires a society that is supported by the pillars of a sustainable democracy, a strong legislature, an independent judiciary, the rule of law, a vibrant civil society, a free press, and an honest police force. 
And if you were to go and you were to look at the speeches that the president has made over the past 10 months, if you were to look at the comments by Secretary Clinton, by the then acting uh, Assistant Secretary for DRL for human, uh, Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor, you would see the same language about institutions over and over again. Let me just mention one other. In his speech broadcast across Africa this summer in July to the Ghanaian Parliament, the President used that same language. We must support strong and sustainable democratic governments. This is about more than just holding elections. It's about what happens between elections. In the 21st century, capable, reliable, and transparent institutions are the keys to success. Strong parliaments, honest police forces, independent judges, an independent press, a vibrant private sector, a civil society. I think that it's telling because there's other things he could have said, right? He could have said human dignity, human rights, individual freedoms, ind religious freedom, private property. But you'll find time and again this language uh, they've been on theme thus far for the past 10 months. Big point two, what has the administration done to this point? And there's not a lot that we can look at, but we can follow the money. The modified 09 budget as it was modified after the administration came into office, and then the funding priorities for 2010. And let me say three things about these. First, in general, there's been continuity with Bush era initiatives. Second, that the place that's taken the hit has been that State Department office uh, for our Bureau for Democracy. However, that doesn't mean that democracy funding has dropped. That money, following a recent trend, is largely going to specific country programs, not through the State Department Bureau of Democracy. And then third, there's been a significant transfer in priorities from civil society funding activities to institutions particularly in what we'll call the greater Middle East. So first, this notion about continuity. Many people, for instance, thought that when the Obama administration came into office, that they would dispense with key Bush era signature initiatives. Let me mention two, the Millennium Challenge Corporation and another, the Middle East Partnership Initiative, which one of my colleagues here mentioned. Not only have both uh, continued, uh, the president has asked for significantly increased funding for them for next year. He signed a new compact with Senegal a few months ago. It looks like those at least have some lease on life. Second, uh, I mentioned the decrease in funding to the, the, the Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor at the State Department. Its actual budget two years ago was $138 plus million. The request this year was $70 million. However, money's going to other places, and where it's going is to country-specific programming to promote democracy. And then third on, this, on, these, on these funding priorities, uh, if we look at the funding for the greater Middle East region, so the Middle East and AFPAC, et cetera, what we'd see is, is that where the money tends to be going is to the three funding streams at the State Department at USAID that have to do with institutions of various types and that the place that's taken the hit, by the way, a 29% hit going into FY 2010, is in the civil society area, which is one of four funding streams identified by the State Department as part of that governing justly area. By the way, other critics would point out, so I should, that there doesn't seem to have been a high level of focus on these issues. Uh, it took the administration until the end of summer just to name uh, an assistant secretary for that position at the State Department. It took, just, it took even longer to name someone for the CEO of MCC. There's still not a name for the International Religious Freedom Ambassador at large. There's still not a name for the USAID director unless something happened in the last few days that I missed. So, big point three. We've, we've talked a little bit about what the administration has said. We've talked a little bit about what the administration has done. Lessons. Now I have eight lessons. So I'm going to give you three. <laughs> uh, first, if, and I think this is a big if that two of my colleagues at least today mentioned, if support for sustainable democracy is a priority for this administration, as the president said in Ghana, as he said at the UN General Assembly in September, as he said at Cairo, as he said, interestingly, in his AFPAC comments in March, if it's a priority, 
then it will require real leadership from the president and a disciplined message to the cabinet and on down to the agencies. And this is a lesson to take from Bush. Bush, for six and a half years, spoke a great talk about democracy, and I'm convinced he believed it, and he pushed from the top down for there to be things happening in a freedom agenda. But did you ever hear the vice president talk about that? Or any of the other cabinet secretaries consistently talk on these issues? And the answer is no, that there was not buying at the senior level. And I'll tell you, the bureaucracy here in Washington can quickly learn what matters. And foreign publics can tell the difference between what a president says and even what a president believes in, but real action by the bureaucracy and by the cabinets. And it wasn't there for the last administration in many ways. If the president's serious, this is an area for leadership. Second. Uh, the president said in some speeches that what we should do is focus on what works. And I think that he's right, that we should focus on what works. And I would direct your attention to studies that look at what types of democracy promotion activities are most likely to work. There's an article in this month's, uh, or uh, this quarter's foreign policy analysis. It's a journal for political scientists about analyzing foreign policy. It's an in-depth article that cites many studies, and it looks at and again, uh, Dan brought up these terms. It looks at top-down approaches to democracy promotion, such as the Millennium Challenge Corporation, which is, uh, provides incentives to elites for accountability in government. It looks at bottom-up approaches, like seeding civil society. And then it looks at inside approaches, funding for legislatures, judiciaries, and the like. And it's actually quite telling because what the, what the studies indicate is, is that the top-down and the bottom-up approaches, there's a demonstrable track record, bless you, that they work. I can say bless you, he was my dissertation advisor. <laughs> Only for one year though, and then he left and went to Notre Dame uh, once upon a time. There's demonstrable track record of top-down and bottom-up approaches working. And I think that you mentioned this when we talked about Eastern Europe. The U.S. engaged democracy activists and civil society during the Cold War in Eastern Europe by funding through agencies like the NED to civil society. It took a long time. We were not the people, the only people responsible for helping out in this area. But there was a track record that it worked and it was those voices, and by the way, they were secular voices at the time, mostly, that were critical to democracy taking root in that part of the world. And if our conversation today is largely about religion and democracy and engaging a highly religious world, particularly the Muslim world, that's a place where the money's gonna have to go. That being said, what this study finds is that in general those inside activities, support to legislatures, judiciaries, et cetera, doesn't work. In fact, what it says is that there's a negative correlation found in a major USAID study between funding for judiciaries and human rights. In other words, if we've put more money into judiciaries in developing countries, what we've actually found is a diminution in human rights practices in that country. That article, well, I, 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 we don't have a lot of time, so I won't say more about that article, but I refer you to it. The point is, focus on what works. And it's unclear to me presently that the administration is doing so. Third, third lesson. The previous administration lacked in some ways a strategic strategic, a coherent, an integrated, a holistic approach to democracy promotion. Now, it got better over time. There's no doubt about that. And then it seemed like we stepped away from it in 2007. But let me mention two ways. One is a weak connection between support for democracy and the other elements of foreign policy, like energy independence or the fight against terrorism. But let's focus for just a moment on just internal consistency and synergies on democracy promoting activities. For example, we don't really have great connections in the way the US government on the one hand supports uh, issues of private property and economic uh, free trade, these types of things, which are certainly part of a larger realm of individual and corporate liberties, and how that connects to something like international religious freedom and those types of liberties. And then how we, how we support say, secular NGOs versus engaging with religious ones. And a lesson from the past, something that we just haven't done well, is the integration, the strategic integration on multiple fronts, 
of promoting democracy. And certainly, the current administration hasn't even put people into place, like at the senior leadership level at USAID, like an ambassador for international religious freedom, who'd be on a team of the strategic leaders on this integrated approach to promoting democracy. Now, I think that I'm 16 seconds over time, so I'll stop there. I didn't answer the four questions, but I have those answers, and maybe we'll get to them in the question and answer. Thank you. Well, thank you to our four panelists for being very conscientious about the time. As a result, we have about a half hour that we can interact with the audience here. Uh, we have a microphone, and if you would stand up, identify yourself, and um, direct your question, if possible, to one of the panelists. My name is David Abramson, and I work at the State Department. Um, and I don't work on these issues, but um, I've worked in the Religious Freedom Office uh, in the past. And I've heard a lot of, uh, there's been a lot of criticism of the Obama administration uh, and what they're not doing in terms of uh, in human rights. But I'm just wondering, I haven't heard a lot of analysis about what they're really thinking, what their, what their uh, plan is. The, in terms of uh, the emphasis on institutions, I, um, that was addressed. But I'm just wondering if you could, anyone on the panel could elaborate on what, uh, provide more in-depth analysis of what their thinking is on human rights rather than what they're not doing. I defer to Dan. <laughs> Everybody's deferring here. Look, I think that, I mean, Posner has just been, a po just been put into position there. I think that it's very hard to answer the question because the administration doesn't have, a, as far as I can tell, a clear-cut answer to the question so far. It's just really beginning to define how to address these issues. And so I think we're not very well placed to answer the question. It's an important question, but when you have so many top positions that haven't been filled, you're not going to get a strategic well, even when we haven't filled, you didn't have the kind of strategic vision that I think is really necessary, but you're not going to get it until the administration uh, uh, fills these positions. But I think the broader point is that the administration came in with a whole set of security issues on its hands, uh, and I think the attention has been mostly around, in and around those security issues. How to uh, sustain a, a focus on those security issues and readdress the democracy human rights issue, that's an answer that we don't have yet. Although. What's implicit in that is that um, 10 months having gone by, positions not having been filled, and the public focus having been on the other issues, that it's obviously not as high a priority as some would prefer it to be, and as clearly as, as high a priority as these other challenges are. So I mean, that is becoming clear. Um, even though the budget numbers look good uh, in a lot of ways, it's, it's still a mystery about how those budget numbers emerged without having had the people in place who normally would be advocating for those budgets. So there's a lot of questions uh, still unanswered. And hopefully by the second year, we'll have more of them answered. Next question. Hello, Knox Thames. I'm with the US Commission on International Religious Freedom. I guess a very basic question is, what has worked? Do you have any specific examples of Uf US government programs that have positively and successfully pulled in religious groups into the democratic process? And secondly, how do you see religious freedom promotion, since we have this special office at the State Department, our independent commission, fitting into uh, democracy assistance efforts? Thanks. I, I just don't know enough about that to answer that. I don't know. Eric, you sound like you may have a better focus. <coughs> Well, I could mention a, uh, a couple of things that I've been wanting to say, Knox. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, let me say one policy recommendation to answer the second part of your question, and that is to level the playing field when it comes specifically to re engaging religious actors, either in terms of economic development or humanitarian assistance, or in terms of democracy promotion. And let me give an anecdote and then explain a little bit more about what I mean. Uh, last year, I happened to sit in on a class at the Foreign Service Institute, and the, the theme of the class was a, a concerted presentation by some government employees about how State Department and aid workers needed to feel free to engage with religious communities in highly religious societies. 
and there were five slides in the presentation. And the first four were about how to do this engagement. The fifth slide was of a pair of human hands behind prison bars, and it said, remember the establishment clause. And the people in the room, 20 diplomats and aid workers, sat back in their chairs. And the, the sense that I had at that moment was, oh, we knew it. We knew all along this is too hard. We're going to lose our jobs. Establishment clause issues, which one of my colleagues here addressed. Uh, it was a really chilling moment. And I don't think that's what was intended to happen. What we've done is kind of set a different set of parameters for engaging with religious actors in those environments than we do with non-religious actors. And I think that the first step would simply to be, in terms of our engagement, to have a level playing field, to treat them like other actors in civil society. Uh, the second thing that I would mention along these lines is the, the notion that one of my colleagues made here. He didn't, I don't think he said the word public diplomacy, but that is this need to understand the uniqueness of the American twin toleration system and to be able to tell that story. And I'm not saying that what the United States needs is a slick promotion campaign like Snapple or Levi's or Nike. But what I am suggesting is, is that uh, some basic training on the uniqueness of this concept and about American religious freedom, how we have this, not a separation like the French style, but this vibrant religious society where people can believe or not believe, they can influence politics, but we don't have a state religion. That should be part of what, of the basic training of our diplomats, of our soldiers, of our aid workers, of anyone engaging on behalf of the United States in foreign publics, and it's currently not. Can I just add a quick word to that? Oh, my colleague here on the right wanted to, uh, as well. The, it depends on what, how you define religious actors. In terms of political groups, um, uh, the United States and its democracy assistance programs is actively engaged every day in working with Islamist groups. This is, this is something that's often not understood, but in Morocco and in Yemen yeah, and in- As political parties. As political parties, but they are Islamist groups with a religious makeup and background, and the leaders come from a religious background. So in Egypt, well, we don't do it officially with the Ikhwan, but with other groups, and in Jordan, and in Kuwait, and in Yemen, and in Bahrain, and in Morocco, and in Indonesia, and in Malaysia, we are heavily involved in dealing with political groups whose roots are in many respects religious. So this is, this is an ongoing part of, of, of our democracy assistance programs. It has been for quite a while. Okay. Yeah, there's two quick points. One is that the last administration, the Bush administration, actively attempted or actively engaged in including, or uh, more than they had been by a lot, religious uh, organizations in the United States. Previously, the argument had been that if they are an overt, overtly religious organization, they are but per se should be excluded or very carefully circumscribed by the Establishment Clause. The last administration overtly and actively engaged in changing that, at least at USAID, so that religious organizations were going to be available and world vision, there were just many of them, uh, that wound up with funds that they hadn't had before. So this was an, this was an overt, uh, very overt, articulated, overt, clear, public campaign by the last administration to change that. The second is, uh, I go back to the point I was making or trying to make very briefly in my own remarks, and that is I think it's a tricky business. I don't think it's a matter, in my opinion, Eric, of just treating everybody the same. They're not the same. Religious organizations, and particularly in societies where religion is particularly important and poignant, are not just like, every, uh, like a, a non-religious secular civil society organization, and US government funds to those organizations will take on a color. And it ought to be, one ought to be a little sensitive about how that's done and what that will look like. What it will look like to the internal audience and what it will look like to the external audience. It's not just, they're, they're not just any old organization off the street. And I think that our U.S. government-supported assistance programs with avowedly religious organizations 
is a tricky way to do it. It's more tricky even than political parties. And we are very insistent that US government assistance to political parties be treated relatively equitably. That any political party that's not violent, that supports democratic outcomes, et cetera, et cetera, ought to be available, ought to be equally engaged in US government supported programs. And I think you have to be, at very least, equally attuned to that sensitivity when you go abroad and deal with religious organizations so that it does not look like we are favoring one political party or one particular religion or one particular religious outlook. And what does that mean to them and what does it mean to us? It's a longer conversation than a two minute response, but I don't think it's quite the same thing as saying everybody should be treated exactly the same. Next question. I wanted to ask a question about uh, the conversation been revolving now, but also earlier, both um, Gerald and Dan talked about promoting uh, liberal theologies in terms in the Islamic world, shunning the kind of approach of trying to tinker with theologies, favoring more of an approach of uh, building institutional environments, you know, to which I'm broadly sympathetic. But I wanted to ask about one instrument which hasn't really been mentioned very much, which is the international human rights instruments which maybe is kind of a combination of values and institutions. Um, and of course, religious freedom as well as so many other features of democracy are ensconced in the international human rights uh, documents, UDHR and the international covenants of the 60s and, and so forth. And um, we also have evidence from the Cold War. I think it's widely demonstrated that inter international human rights documents could be I instrumental in, you know, the, human, the Eastern European dissidents today you know, now say that that was instrumental for you know, helping to um, win their freedom and so forth. Um, you know, what are the sort of uh, pluses and minuses of this, uh, of this tool? Can I, just, can I just go first because I, I gotta leave. Uh, you know, I think, that's an, I think it's an excellent example. Uh, I, I, it's not so obvious to me that there are not religious communities out there for which the tenets of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights are uh, high on their agenda, to say the least. So what happens when a religious uh, community wants to participate in a, de in a democratic process but does not subscribe to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights? And one of the issues that was talked about earlier today by P Prime Minister was gender equality. There are not a small number of religious communities for which gender equality, as we understand it, is not uh, on their agenda, whether theologically not or practically not. So at what point do we say, okay, fine, you know, we should be supporting them as opposed to supporting their right to participate? I, I think these are all, that's the tricky part on our side. The tricky part on their side is do we look like we are trying to subvert or suborn or whatever their religious beliefs by including them in a US government campaign, that's how it would be put, to undermine the, the purity of the religious fervor and religious uh, ardor and religious character of their society that they want to build. Last point is that you know this issue, I think, is a post-2001 issue. There's been a lot of talk about religious, religious this and religious that, but I think mostly it's been as a response to 2001 and, this, and the challenge of Islamism and jihadism. Mostly it's a, it's a cover for talking about Islam. You rarely hear people saying, boy, I wonder what those Hindus are thinking, or I wonder what those Buddhists are thinking. Some extent maybe in Sri Lanka, but only as a human rights issue and what happens to the minority Tamils. It's, this is, this is, a, it is a way of talking about the rise of Islamic fervor and Islamic um, fundamentalism maybe and jihadism. And that is what has gained the attention. I think we ought to recognize that that is what the, the origin of a lot of this discussion is about. And fair enough, but that's, that's where it's coming from and that's the, the audience and the practical dimension in which uh, these issues are taught. You rarely hear this in, in, uh, in uh, about uh, democracy promotion or democracy assistance in um, non-Islamic countries. 
Latin America, for example. I mean, plenty of Islam, plenty of religious fervor there, but you don't really hear about it in terms of the democracy uh, programming in Latin America. Should we engage more with the evangelicals or the pen, or the or the Catholic uh, Church or whatever it might be? Others. I think the plus is way out, way the minuses, because it, it moves it from an American discussion to an international discussion. Shireen Ebadi was here uh, some months ago and gave a very forthright speech at, at uh, Carnegie, which USIP co-sponsored, and she said, you know, we, we Iran, is, are signatories to <laughs> many of these treaties, and, and if you raise that in terms of treaty commitments uh, as opposed to a U.S. political agenda, it has more resonance. So I think there's a lot of good reasons, both strategic and tactical, to make this, to, to make this, this approach a focus of our efforts, particularly when we're dealing with countries such as Iran, we have an interest in negotiating. Um, at the same time, how do we sort of re sustain or reignite this sort of human rights question? That is an important way to do it. Anything else? All right. I think, uh, where's our next question? Right back there. Kathy Cosman. Uh, unfortunately, they were addressed to Mr. Hyman, who has to leave at the moment. <laughs> but um, one of them having to do with how you uh, define Turkey as an Islamic or increasingly Islamic state. If you mean the AK Party, that may be some. That there may be something to that. But if you view the Constitution, which is modeled on that of France, there's a complete. Uh, uh, the government tries to keep the public role of religion to a distinct minimum. Um, well, that's true, but that that's a little different than how I understood what you said. No, but Well, if I uh, just elaborate on that very quickly, you know, Turkey is not, I mean, a secular state. The, the Turkish government funds and controls the religious I, establishment, I of course. That, but They're very involved in sort of deciding what the imams I, will say and what they won't say. It's an interesting added Turkian vision of, of, of secularism. I, but I do think the issue of, in Turkey, which you're raising, is, is, is the extent to which if the AK Party, through the courts and other means, is able to intimidate, threaten, or certainly make nervous uh, advocates of secularism of one kind or the other uh, to the point which the military feels it has to stand in, what will happen to Turkish democracy? There needs to be a recognition by those who are in power that the instruments, in, the instruments of democracy will not be used, including the issue of religious freedom, to impose their ideological religious agenda on others. And that's a major debate in Turkey. And it's one that, in many respects, under the Bush administration was ignored because we wanted to hold up the AK Party as the example, the, the example, the obvious example of Islamic democracy. And so nobody wanted to really get into the discussion of what was going on beneath the surface or just above it in terms of changes in Turkey. So I think it was ignored. And it was ignored at, at our peril because it really has undermined the capacity of both these sides to talk to one another. Well, uh, so far the Constitutional Court has, has ruled the day, but I wanted also to raise the question that if one views things from an American perspective, perhaps Islam is the focus. However, if one looks at countries like Russia or a large number of other countries where the governments then view a wide variety of religions in addition to or aside from Islam as potential threats to, to its own sources of power, um, I think then we have to widen our range of concern to, to a much larger number of religions. And finally, I wanted to say that it seems to me that um, public diplomacy, if we also look at publicly funded international broadcasting, um, whether this, these kinds of issues are at all addressed by VOA or RFERL, I think is another valid thing to look at. I'm, I'm Steve Kalecki with the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops. 
I kind of like to go back to the question of creating a level playing field between religious and secular uh, groups overseas and so forth. And I'll just make a couple of observations. You know, a, a very vibrant civil society that includes vibrant religious institutions, I think, is essential to democracy. I think that's been a premise of our whole day so far. And religious institutions have significant infrastructure. They enjoy the trust of people. They have, they're culturally embedded. They're there for the long term. And yet, uh, our consistent experience has been that both the US government and, and many other donor nations consistently underfund religious-based groups doing the very same work uh, than, than groups that are not religiously affiliated. And I wonder if that is perhaps based on our exaggerated separation of church and state models that is part of the weakness of religious freedom within our own country. Um, and just a comment on that. It seems to me a level playing field might be a good thing to really promote robust development of civil society, including religious elements of civil society, which contribute to democratization. And of course, you wouldn't want to directly fund proselytizing, but religions do a lot more than simply gain adherence. They deliver social services, they educate children, and so on and so forth. Where's Jerry? <laughs> Uh, I mean, in some ways, that's a softball to me where I would say, yes. Uh, maybe I could just make a few comments on that along those lines. The first one is, is that, uh, and it comes back to the point that Jerry made earlier, there was a expose, I mean, it was written in pretty harsh language in the Boston Globe a couple of years ago about this radical increase in funding to faith-based organizations through USAID during the Bush era. And the amount basically doubled. In other words, USAID provides most of its development assistance to local partners on the ground. And this five-day expose was pretty harsh in its language, very skeptical about church and state issues and whatnot. By the end of the expose, what you came to realize, though, is, is that nonetheless, by the end of the Bush era, 81% of the funding to private groups through USAID was not going to religious actors. At its heyday under Bush, only 19% of those development dollars ended up going to faith-based actors on the ground in Nigeria, et cetera. Uh, so it really wasn't quite as dramatic as, as we've been led to believe, I think. The, let me just make one other point, though, and that is, I, I, you know, I'm skeptical about the application of the Establishment Clause, which is about our domestic life abroad. That being said, there's many, many things to promote democracy and to promote U.S. foreign relations that can be done that aren't about money. One is ambassadors meeting with the highly legitimate religious authorities within a country. You think about Nigeria, the most religious country perhaps on the face of the earth. The Sultan of Sokoto called the last two U.S. ambassadors to Nigeria his brothers when he met with them at the Council on Foreign Relations here in Washington. He is heard by 90 million co-religionists. Our last two or three ambassadors have had close relationships also with the Anglican primate, with the Catholic cardinal, et cetera. That's one thing. I could mention seven or eight, and I'm running Dan out. <laughs> uh, have a good flight, Dan. Uh, Sorry, we're peeling off. I know, I know. I'll be the last man standing. Uh, <laughs> but there's many things that could be done to promote respect, to... Uh, to have a dialogue, like the pr Prime Minister said during our lunch talk today, that don't involve money and where we're not having to worry about these Establishment Clause issues. And certainly the issue that Dan brought up about uh, calling countries to account in a friendly way or in a harsher way on religious freedom and human rights is one of those things that engages religious actors that cost nothing. Question over here. Uh, my name is Margot Bedron. I'm from the Woodrow Wilson Center. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, I just, um, Mr. Hyman has left, but he um, caused me to raise my hand immediately. I think we need to um, be aware that there are very strong arguments for gender equality and social justice being made um, within an Islamic religious framework. And this has been going on for 20 years. There are strong women's and mixed groups um, and networks so I think we ought to take that into account and understand and know about it and that there are possibilities within an Islamic religious framework um, to articulate gender equality and to promote its uh, practice. 
The other thing that's a little bit unnerving, I must say that I've lived in the Middle East, uh, in and out of the Middle East for 30 years. I have dual nationality um, with Egypt and here. And, um, and I've moved around in other parts of the Muslim world. And I've just been back three days from Mor uh, Morocco, where I've spoken uh, part of the public affair, American public affairs um, uh, set up. And I've spoken to people in the ministry of Al-Kaf and other religious groups and secular groups and so on. And we could talk about issues of, uh, of gender equality using, I mean, within uh, universal frameworks and religious frameworks. Um, I feel that a lot of the comments here make me, I mean, they make me uneasy that secular seems so rigid and religion, religious seems so rigid and there is slippage between Islamic and Islamist and religious that isn't political and, and uh, that has um, concerned me. Thank you. Thank you. Another question? Good. <laughs> Thank you. First, a comment. Um, I think uh, um, Professor Philpott's work and others shows that uh, political theologies do change over time. So seconding this uh, comment that we just heard, we might be, it might be better if we're thinking about how to change maybe or how could it possibly institutions could affect ideas in this sense. Well, idea, we know that ideas affect institutions, but we also know that institutions affect ideas. So one thing that we could hear more about is whether you have any thoughts about how this could happen. And we could engage more and more with more than 20 million or, or whatever uh, subgroups of, of Islam and so on and so forth. And I think that's possible. If uh, Christianity, which also had, as we all know, uh, issues with gender equality, uh, and still does in some genres of Christianity. So it's not that new. Um, as a problem. Uh, second, which is really a question, this is a, the real question, do we have, even have an, a sense of an evaluation of these programs that the US government has um, promoted in terms of, um, I don't know, probably Eric would be the most adequate to answer this, uh, but maybe Thomas as well, uh, with respect to supporting groups, religious or non-religious, and how successful these efforts have been? Uh, because I hear a lot about many places, but I've never seen an evaluation of those programs, whether they were successful or not. So I was, or maybe you have something more to say about this. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. Um, let me offer two observations. Uh, one is that um, you're, uh, you risk opening up an enormous uh, can of worms if you start asking about evaluating the impact of democracy programs more generally and whether uh, you think that a project level evaluation of you know a year's worth of seminars or an exchange visit is meant to have some enduring social change in a place or contribute to long-term democratization? Um, I would say I'll, I'll stipulate as one of the uh, people that commits uh, some of these programs uh, that um, there's inadequate review of their long-term impact, um, and uh, we don't know a lot in the end about what programs work and don't work. Um, other than that. Sometimes people in Eastern Europe say decades later that you know Radio Free Europe was really important to them, or uh, an exchange uh, was really important to somebody uh, 20 years later in their career when they become somebody important. So there's a lot of anecdotal evidence that encourages us to keep doing or improving the things we're doing, but that it's hard to ultimately um, justify it on a dollar per democracy ratio basis. Um, that said, uh, just to sort of pick up on a point that Eric made earlier about the way that USAID and the US government more generally spend their money. Um, I'm not, maybe I misunderstood the way you put it, Eric, but um, USAID doesn't mostly give its money to civil society groups in foreign countries. It, it mostly gives it to American groups mm -hmm. to go abroad and spend the money and do things with partners in countries. So most of the US government's money is handed directly to American civil right. society groups or contractors or institutions to go forth and do their thing. And one of the themes that is emerging now in some of the discussions around town uh, led by parts of the Obama administration is that they're questioning what the value added is of the American intermediaries. Um, would it be better just to give the money directly, you know, in the Middle East democracy program, for instance, and Egypt is a big part of this discussion, um, rather than have Freedom House or NDI or um, Georgetown University, you know, be the uh, enterprise that organizes exchanges or training. 
uh, shouldn't the U.S. government just give money to groups in Egypt or anywhere else in the world? You know, cut out the middleman, more of the money gets where you want it to go, um, and uh, they'll know that we, that is the U.S. government, are their friend, not the American trade union movement or the political parties or the universities or the NGO community. And so there's a, this is actually going to be a highly contested question in the next couple of years about what the value is of all these American uh, implementers. Any closing thoughts there? Just say... Uh, Two very quick answers to your question. The first one is that the argument that I made about a level playing field, I think, answers part of your question, and that is if the U.S. consistently supports a level playing field in other societies characterized by human rights and civil liberties, that religious actors and non-religious actors should be able to compete in that square equally, that that provides that window for political theologies to evolve without the U.S. ever meddling in the actual themes or messages of those political theologies. The se if you want to see uh, some evidence in a debate format, basically two very contrasting pieces of literature looking at the effectiveness of programs. Someone earlier mentioned uh, last week's Washington Post front page article about the Civil Society in Islam program run by USAID and the Asia Foundation for 10 years in Indonesia. And this article was very dismissive of the program. Interestingly, it didn't really get into the major study of the program run by uh, Bob Hefner, who I think is at Boston or at Harvard right now, uh, published three years ago, that uh, he worked on the project. It was an in-depth, multi-layered study talking about all the good things that happened through that program, which lasted for a decade. So uh, you can get both the study online and the Washington Post article, and there's some evidence there. You, you could reason it out for yourself. Great. Please join me in thanking our two remaining panelists and the others that have